The other option is that the Fed can do what the UK did, which is with, you know, if the treasury market breaks, they might have to come in and do surprise buying of long duration bonds. And if they want to be conservative about it, they could they could try to sell short duration bonds to offset that. So they can say, okay, well, you know, we're still holding our balance sheet flat, uh, but we're we're twisting the 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 duration of bonds we hold. Um, so that you know, they have a range of options that they can do, but they're kind of variations on the theme of money printer go burr, right? So so when the when the sovereign bond market breaks, it it basically, you know, you, you need more currency, more more reserve creation. Uh, or, or more leveraging to to buy those bonds. And that's kind of the, you know, right now the biggest question of macro is, is how much can the Fed tighten uh, in their quest to rein in inflation? And will something like that break uh, and force the Fed to pause or pivot earlier than they'd like to? Uh, and so that, that I'm watching the treasury market pretty closely to, to, you know, to see how close they might be getting to, to what we just saw happen to the UK bond market. So I, I'd be looking at liquidity indicators. Well, one is yields, right? So if yields keep grinding higher uh, on the long end of the curve, that that's an indicator. Uh, number two, I'd be looking at at liquidity conditions, right? So for example, Bloomberg has a, an index of of government market, uh, government bond market liquidity, right? So there are various ways to quantify this, uh, and so you, basically you just look for quantitative measures uh, of you know the reduction in quality and liquidity in what is supposed to be a very liquid. Um, uh, and safe market, and and we are seeing signs of that. It's basically, m- you know, most things are showing that it's about as bad as it's it's gotten, except for March 2020. That was worse. It's not it's not fully broken like it did then. March 2020 in the U.S. looked like what just happened in in the U.K. Basically, right. uh, and so we're not there yet, but it, it's directionally, uh, you know, not looking healthy for the U.S. Treasury market. Uh, so. In some ways, yes, because it, it gives them more exposure to long duration treasuries, which which could potentially put them in a similar situation as UK pensions. In practice, um, I think that, you know, given that they would always backstop that with some degree of yield curve control if needed, um, I, in, in practice, I would not be worried about the solvency uh, of the US banking system. Uh, you know, in some ways, they're positioned the exact opposite of 2008 now. So in 2008, banks had very low uh, treasuries and cash as a percentage of their assets, which meant that the you know the vast majority of their assets consisted of loans and riskier securities, uh, and so those that's the portion that's subject to nominal default risk, whereas the the cash and supposed to the treasuries are not. Uh, whereas now they're very highly allocated to cash and treasuries, uh, and so they have you know and, and so they have more of a basically they would have to have worse defaults on the risky side of their book. In order to have a similar event of what happened in 2008, right? Uh, and so overall, I'm not really worried about U.S. banks, but it, it basically would stuff them uh, with with more treasuries if they decide to do that instead of putting those on on the Fed Fed balance sheet. So they have some options. Uh, it, you know, it's apart from regulations. So so various regulations have basically, uh, you know, it made it. Uh, so the banks have to have kind of just more safe collateral. Mm-hmm. And then two, uh, above that kind of minimum threshold, we've just not been seeing a, a ton of bank lending uh, compared to, to prior rates. Banks generally um, in the U.S. And, and many other places have been have been pretty conservative uh, with, with, you know, exceptions uh, like we see in some well-known European banks. Well, so before Europe had acute energy shortages, I was already viewing this as kind of an end game for this long term cycle, which is basically that, right, you know, we've had four decades of lower and lower interest rates and higher and higher debt to GDP across the developed world. And, you know, that when you when you hit the zero bound uh, or in some cases mildly negative, uh, you no longer have an offset. So so when debt is rising, but interest rates are falling, the in, the, the debt servicing costs are you know, often flat. They're you know they're not going up, uh, but when you have uh, you know a situation where interest rates are now flat or up, while debt as a percentage of GDP is also going up, that that's when you have that very dangerous combination of, of actually higher and higher debt servicing costs, including at the sovereign level, uh, and that's when central banks run into you know a, a Kobayashi Maru. It's an impossible uh, scenario that there's there's no solution for, and so you know they're, what they're supposed to do is if you have high inflation, you tighten. Uh, and if you have, you know, low inflation, high unemployment, you loosen. That's that's kind of the the, the model that they've that they've been in. The, what breaks that model is stagflation. When you have both weak economic situation, uh, financial instability, basically, you know, too much debt starts blowing up, 
uh, and you have high inflation. Uh, and so historically, like in the 1940s, which is the, the time we have to look back to find this, this combination for developed markets, you had major inflation, uh, you had major currency devaluation, you had huge spreads between inflation and yields, uh, and you had pockets of yield curve control and financial repression. Uh, which is basically all sorts of capital controls to prevent capital from moving around freely. Uh, you, you basically had to trap various entities into owning these bonds uh, and you had central banks buying the bonds. And so that's the situation I find or I, I've been describing us as, as entering anyway for a couple of years and we're starting to see that play out. Now, we've now added to it acute energy shortages. Uh, and really the only way out there is kind of emergency response like to, to get more energy supply. Basically, countries should be doing everything in their power to you know, figure out how to get persistently more energy supply and to incentivize companies to go out and, and get more energy supply. Uh, because for some countries, it is a, a national security risk at this point. And as you point out, it hurts the, the, you know, the, the, the least uh, resourceful members in society, the ones with the least, the least ability to pay for that are the ones that are most impacted. Uh, and so uh, the way I've been describing it is that we're going to get periods of inflation until we fix the energy system. Uh, and, and that's unfortunately that that can take quite a while to happen. And so, you know, you know when I kind of rank things that would keep me up at night in terms of, of markets, you know, acute energy shortages are, are pretty much at the top. Uh, you know, in, in developing countries, food and energy kind of compete for that top slot. In developed countries, you don't really have to worry about food shortages uh, because they're, you know, they're there's more resources to fix that, and instead, it's about energy shortages because those are those are complex problems that are that are that take a lot of time to fix, uh, because you know grids are complex, energy sources can't be changed on a dime, uh, you know import infrastructure needs to be changed, uh, new new wells and new uh, you know reserves have to be uh, created to to produce more of the energy that that's, that's being in short supply. And so there's really no way out until the energy energy system is is resolved, and that I think it's going to take years. So I, I think currency diversification uh, is always reasonable. The the caution I would I would give is that when we do reach a point where the Fed is unable to keep tightening, right? So so it, it's really that that rate of change that matters. When the when the Fed is tightening more aggressively than most other developed market central banks, the interest rate spread uh, between what you get on on U.S. assets compared to foreign assets is wider. Uh, and so, you know, for example, there's a lot of incentive to sell Japanese assets and buy U.S. assets. Uh, but when that stops increasing, um, and it, it, especially if the treasury market breaks and the and the Feds or you know or the bank system is forced to do some type of liquidity operation to to fix that, similar to the U.K., uh, that could be a, a structural peak in the dollar uh, for a period of time relative to other currencies. So, so right now, we've had the perfect conditions for dollar rally because you know we are more energy sufficient. We, uh, you know, the, the the Fed is is tightening more aggressively. Um, there, there is all these dollar denominated debts throughout the world that, that basically represents demand for dollars. Uh, but there are major periods in history where you get a huge spike in the dollar and then you get a huge fall in the dollar. So, so with the U.S. dollar situation, the, the one of the biggest weaknesses that the U.S. has had relative to the rest of the developed world is that we run these bigger trade deficits, which are normally bad for a currency.